Even as Apple watches are conquering the wrists of folks all over the world, traditional watches have held their ground. In fact, people today are more curious about retro stuff like vinyl and Polaroids than ever before. Mechanical watches are another piece of retro that are making a comeback lately. And in this video, we're going to tell you exactly what the deal is. But before we jump from smartwatches to the opposite of a smartwatch, let's stop by the step-by-step in between. Quartz. In 1969, Japanese watchmaker Seiko permanently changed the face of the watch industry. They debuted a watch with a very simple mechanism, a tiny electrical oscillator circuit that was clocked by a piece of quartz crystal. What makes quartz crystal so great for keeping time is that it has a reverse piezoelectric effect. Don't know what that means? It's okay. Don't worry about it. What you should know is that the reverse piezoelectric effect allows the quartz signal to generate a signal of one hertz or one cycle per second. Mother Nature is a lot more accurate than the works of man. And quartz watches quickly decimated the Swiss watch industry and their mechanical timepieces. Quartz watches are cheaper and far more accurate than the most accurate mechanical watches. You might be wondering then why it's the mechanical watches that are making a comeback instead of quartz. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of mechanical watches. But first, let's look at how one works. The key component of a mechanical watch is its movement. It is, in a real sense, the heart of the watch. If we break a mechanical watch down into its most basic components, there are really just four to note. There's the case or the body of the watch. The hands, which actually tell you the time, are often called the handset. And then there's the dial or the face, where the numbers or indices are shown around the edge of the watch. If there are any complications, they'll be visible on the dial too. Those are just cosmetic components. The actual work of the watch is done by its movement, also known as the caliber. It's, in a word, the entire mechanism that powers the watch. Timekeeping has a rich history of individual watchmakers painstakingly assembling these movements by hand, using parts so tiny they can only be seen under a microscope. How are these movements made now? Watch nerds will often talk about in-house movements versus third-party movements. Clearly, the industrialization of the watch industry means you don't have to go to your local watchmaker to make you a watch anymore. Watch companies put out thousands of units of hundreds of models now, and they need to source their movements in bulk. In-house movements, as the name suggests, means that the company has their own manufacturing capability to make movements. Companies like Seiko, Rolex, and IWC manufacture their own movements, and Seiko in particular sells them to other companies. Meanwhile, third-party movements are brought off the shelf from other manufacturers. Seiko is one of the biggest sources for movements, and Rolex provides movements to Tudor. But that particular segment of the industry is dominated by ETA, whose movements can be found in every level of the watch world, from entry-level Hamiltons to prize Pateks, The heart is ETA. What difference does this make? Practically speaking, it's mostly a matter of prestige. Companies that can make their own movements are usually considered cooler in the eyes of watch nerds. It doesn't make much of a difference on the price in the grand scheme of things. There are some pros and cons to consider. Companies that make their own movements will offer you a better commitment to servicing the watch, both preventative and corrective. On the other hand, if a company like ETA is trusted by some of the biggest watchmakers on the planet, that tells you everything you need to know about their reliability. In the beginning, there was the mainspring. Mechanical calibers are made up of super tiny components. We'll run through the most essential ones. Attached to the crown of the watch is its mainspring. You often hear talk of winding mechanical watches. And what that means is that you rotate the crown and that coils up the spring inside. When you click the crown back into its place, the mainspring starts to unravel. There's kinetic energy, which is basically movement energy in that rotation. And that energy is what powers the movement. What you need to understand as we go forward is that by winding the watch, you've given it an energy input, and the output of that energy must be the rotation of the second hand. But springs aren't exactly precise. The unwinding of the spring will be fast at first, and then will gradually slow down. The chief goal of everything else in the movement is to derive only as much energy as is required from the spring. So how does the rest of the movement use up the main spring's energy? Connected to the spring is a series of gears, which we can collectively call the gear train. The gears are conjoined by their teeth, and as gears usually are, and this means that gears can't turn much faster than the maximum speed required for the watch to function. It also means that the gear releases the kinetic energy it's inheriting from the spring in a more controlled manner. At the other end of the gear train is the escapement. It's a wheel that is ultimately rotated by the energy being released from the mainspring. But thanks to the gears, the escapement rotates at a relatively consistent speed. This is important because the escapement is responsible for spinning the balance wheel. It might not sound that way, but things are happening pretty fast inside the movement. And yet, a watch is only
only supposed to count seconds. The balance wheel is calibrated in such a way that a certain number of its rotations are equivalent to one second. Speaking of the seconds, the balance wheel is naturally responsible for controlling the dial train. This is the mechanism behind the handset. The balance wheel's chief concern is the second hand, which must complete one rotation around the dial in 60 seconds. So the balance wheel ticks the second hand, and the complete rotation of the second hand ticks the minute hand, and the complete rotation of the minute hand ticks the hour hand. And that's how a mechanical watch tells time. Whew, that sounds like a lot, but that's all there is to it, right? Well, not quite. There are two more things we need to cover. First of all, every mechanical watch has something called a power reserve. When you wind a watch before going out, you want it to last at least a whole day, right? No one's going to take a bathroom break and quickly rewind their watch. A watch's power reserve is the amount of time that the mainspring takes to fully unravel. In other words, it's a watch's charge. 24 hours is about what you should expect for the power reserve of a budget mechanical watch. But these can be up to 72 and even 96 hours or even more. The second thing we need to cover is the difference between a manual watch and an automatic watch. Both are mechanical watches, but what we've described above is basic a manual watch. To make this manual and automatic, you'd need one more component, the rotor. This is a nifty doohickey that swings with the movement of your arm when you're wearing the watch. As it moves, it rotates the main spring and basically winds it. That's why it's called an automatic, and it means you don't have to use your power reserve as long as you wear the watch. Now we're sure this is all sounding really cool, but does that mean you should buy a mechanical watch? Hey, we don't want to trample on your dreams. That being said, here are a few things you should consider before investing in a mechanical watch. And we do mean that it's an investment. You can totally get good mechanical watches for around $100, but you'll have to accept compromises. Best case scenario, you're giving up complications. Worst case scenario, your watch is just going to be inaccurate. The nature of the mechanical movements means that even the Omega Speedmaster's movement, the one that went to the moon, is at least a little inaccurate. If you can afford it, a mid-range or high-end watch will have such a tiny margin of error that you wouldn't care about it. On the other hand, some of those $100 watches can be up to 20 seconds slow and 40 seconds fast per day. Plus, the winding is a chore that some people enjoy and others will be irritated by. On the other hand, a watch nerd would argue that the appeal of a mechanical has nothing to do with functionality or practicality. It's all about the magic. You will never tire of watching that second hand sweep smoothly across the dial. You will never stop thinking about the feat of engineering that is the movement in your watch. You will never not love the fact that the watch you're wearing could be older than you and will outlive you by centuries. It's hard to put a price tag on stuff like that. But if hearing us talk about it does something for you, then maybe a mechanical watch is worth it for you. We just hope that we helped your decision-making process. And that's it for today's video. Does this make you want to buy a mechanical watch now? Or do you think your money is better served with practical options? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.